and they're here to share some of their knowledge with you. A new episode drops every Thursday. If you enjoy the show, please share it with a friend and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And visit www.stonesisters.com for more information just like this. Hi, welcome back to our podcast, Real Estate for Real People. Thank you so much for tuning in to us today. We are thrilled. We have Allison McLeod from Doak Sheriff. I almost said the other one as Tamara was joking ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> and you are a partner at Doak Sheriff. Yes. And you're going to join us today. We get to learn about all the new things that are happening in the real estate industry from a legal standpoint. Yes. And then some of the pitfalls and some of the things that uh, people need to look out for. Yep. Well, so many things have been talked about in the press lately. We're hearing mm -hmm. about the foreign buyer ban, about the rescission rule. We're hearing about, you know, flipping tax. And I think everybody's got a lot of questions and we're grateful that you could come today and yeah. help shed a little bit of light and, uh, and just steer people in a direction perhaps to answer some questions. Yep. That sounds perfect. So let's jump, jump right into it. Um, maybe you can actually do a little intro of yourself and tell us a bit about you. You obviously you live here in Kelowna. Have you lived here for a long time? Uh, I've been here since 2014. So I'm a partner at Doak Sheriff. Uh, I practice in residential uh, real estate uh, and then corporate commercial law. So uh, commercial lending, um, anything to do buying and selling businesses, incorporating businesses and commercial leasing. So Typically, lots of properties involved in uh, in all of those aspects of wow. law that I work in. So, so yeah. So that. Uh, so you're large, busy. It, yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah, that, that by and large keeps me out of trouble. And then, uh, as we were sort of chatting before, spent a good chunk of uh, Christmas trying to uh, wrap my head around all of these new laws that right. have uh, yeah. descended upon us. Yeah, so. It must be hard when a new law comes out and you're expected to just know it instantly and you have to study. And I'm sure the information that you have to go through is like piles of stuff to. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah, you've so, got to be careful. You've you yeah. really got to know and have done your research. So. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, there, there's a lot out there and, and a lot new. And, and, you know, there's because it's so new, there is lots of uncertainty. So as we were mentioning mm -hmm. before we went live here, uh, the general kind of takeaway is just proceed cautiously. Um, you know, kind of take your time, especially if you're a foreign buyer, um, just because yeah. there's lots of things that you can trip on sort of along the way. So, and hire a professional, right? Yep, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Make sure you get Allison help. <laughs> yes. Well, that, and that's actually a really, really good point. You know, sometimes, and, and there are some great notaries out there, certainly, but I think when you're navigating any of these new rules or challenges or what have you, I think it's really, really important to have a lawyer yep. who's, yes. who's able to give some advice. Whereas, you know, a notary can do do the conveyancing, but, but the legal side of things for the advice becomes a little tricky. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about, you know, some of these new rules. You can start with, you know, I know there's a few, which one do you want to start with? <laughs> uh, we'll start with uh, the foreign buyer one. Cause that's probably going to kind of take the most time. We can knock yes. off most of that and, and the other ones we can get through a little bit more. Perfect. Uh, just kind of touch upon some high points at the end. Uh, so the for foreign buyer ban, it's in effect now, uh, came into effect January 1, 2023, in effect for two more years. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, we'll see how much it actually affects the market. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, I, I don't know how many um, of our purchasers are foreign buyers, but, you Not know, many, especially here. And I think even when they run the numbers for across Canada, it, it really is pretty minor. What was it when yeah. we were at that last 3%, convention? 3%. Mm -hmm. I think statistically they're saying the, you know, the number of buyers across the country is about 3% that... Mm. that for residential. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So, and then in Kelowna, I think it would be less than that. 1%? Yeah, yeah. if even that. Yeah. yeah. So, but... In Either any way. event, should this cross anybody's desk, um, what you need to be aware of is it's the two-year ban uh, for foreign buyers. So that means the, the very high overview is just a not a Canadian citizen, not a permanent resident. Um, and then even if it's a Canadian company, if 3% of that company is owned, it, it's that low of a threshold. Oh, wow. wow, I didn't um, know that. that can, yeah, so they, huh. you know, having a Canadian company that has, even if it's a minority, say 40% that's foreign owned, um, it's actually a very low, low threshold of three. So it, wow. yeah. they, they've kind of. So basically know. it has to be Canadian, hundred yeah. percent Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So that's, you know, and there's different little kind of carve outs that, um, you know, if I'm Canadian, if my spouse were American, right. um, then they could sort of piggyback, uh, along with me. Uh, right. Okay. But then they still have to pay the foreign buyer's tax. So, <laughs> oh, right. so you know, these things are, yeah. you know, there's still lots kind of in play. And that's why it's, there's sort of many spinning plates or moving parts or whatever analogy you want to use. But um, 
And now a question we get asked a lot about, is it everywhere? Like, is there, mm-hmm. you know, I know it's in Kelowna, of course, but, you know, is it in Vernon? Is it in Penticton? Or, you know. Uh, so, Yes. Uh, and then I, yeah. I'm going to stumble pro- uh, across uh, how to pronounce it correctly. There's a census agglomerate area and then the census metropolitan area. And those are if you have a core of 10,000 or sort of a wider buffer of 100,000. Um, ah, okay. But what you want to be careful of, um, there's maps out there that will link and say it's Kelowna. And so then you think, okay, well, what about West Kelowna? What about Lake right. Country? What about Peachland? Right. And so then you have to do a little bit of a deeper dive because... Penticton is listed on this one map, but West Kelowna isn't. And West Kelowna and Penticton are very similar in size. So as you do a deeper dive, you see that under the umbrella of Kelowna, um, they've actually drawn a fairly big circle around Kelowna um, to encapture these other uh, municipalities. Right. So it's, you know, be very um, inquisitive, I guess, and, you know, get counsel to help with this, but, yes. but well, don't just look at it and say, okay, it's not listed on this one, uh, one map, one list, whatever right. it, because the other thing is, so Lake country isn't listed because I looked this morning and their population of 2021 was 9,100 people. So they're not going to grow by 900 people in the next two years. Right. But, right. You know, there might be other municipalities in BC that, what if they're at 9,800 you know right like, right in that two-year period that's what you have to look at if it grows to that ten thousand. yeah so right this okay. is take your time you know don't if you have a foreign buyer don't rush through any of this because absolutely the a there are fines for anybody who assists a foreign buyer sort of try to mm-hmm. circumvent the rules right um of ten thousand. so realtor mm-hmm. lawyer uh, mortgage Anyone, broker right. anybody could get hit with this fine and then if the deal completes and the foreign bo- buyer is caught after the fact, they can be forced to sell the property and they're forced to sell it for the purchase price. Mm. And so... Minus fees or anything on top well, of that. Well, and so that's just it. So purchase price, from my reading, doesn't include your um, transfer, tax. transfer tax. It doesn't, you know, any of that kind right. of stuff. So that's gone. So the idea being that if you have you know, tried to, to work around these rules, you can't profit from them. So, no. you know, if you buy the property for 900,000 and it gets sold for a million, then you'd get your 900 back less any fees that the crown would incur in forcing the sale. Right. And then whatever the proceeds would be, but it's just paid to receiver general of Canada. Wow. I don't right. know how they're going to track it, but. But that's the general idea anyway. Yeah. Like okay. it's, if you, you know, forge ahead and say, whatever, we'll pay the $10,000 fine. I want to buy that property. There's more they to can, it. They can force, right. they can force a sale. Right. That's, okay. that's a really good point. That so I think good. it's fair to assume for, for any buyers that, that we would be working with, with anybody considering purchasing in Canada, you're not going to be able to, if you, if you're not a Canadian resident or, or, yeah. or if you don't buy in one of these Something Small really rural areas, right. right? You know, but then yeah, just tread very carefully as to making sure that you're. Now I in wonder. A small area. That's good. I wonder if we'll start to see people getting into rental agreements with some of these owners, if if a seller would entertain that. And I don't know if that's allowed, but I wouldn't think there would be anything wrong with that. To do, we're going to pay. You know, we get into a rental agreement for two years, and then we have an agreement that we buy that property after the two year period. Only tricky possible? thing is that rule very easily could get extended. Yeah, you know, and we you're won't right. know until, you know, 20 months ahead of now. Mm-hmm. And they may say it was due to run out, you know, January 1st, 2025, yeah. but now it's yeah. going to be extended until 2030. So that's yeah, true. Yeah. It, interesting. They, they could, because I, you know, I think from a policy perspective, it's easy, you know, once it's in place to extend mm-hmm. something. And then also what the act says is if they acquire a uh, legal or equitable interest and then in BC in any event, there's case uh, law that okay. says upon execution of the agreement, you uh, would have that interest. So it's not right. even like you could enter into a contract, you know, say it's even near the tail end, right? November, December of 2024 to buy right. in 2025. Again, if the deal closes after the ban has been lifted, presuming it doesn't get extended. I don't know how they're going to monitor a private contract being entered into. Right. But, but, but again, technically you want to take. Yeah. Really. Again. And again, it's, that's the rule that you can't technically until after the ban is done. Yeah. And, and that's so, something too, that people will argue about that, that can you enter into the contract or not, but there is 
you know, what, there was an argument to be made that on signing the contract, you'd have an interest and makes sense. Yeah, of it's, course. It's interesting because, you know, you wonder, I know other countries around the world have this where, where mm -hmm. you can't go, I mean, for years you couldn't just go and buy property in Mexico and you can't buy property in Japan. And uh, there are numerous countries all over that those rules have been in place forever, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. as long as I know. And, and you know, I, this likely isn't going to just end in two years mm -hmm. would be my guess, but yeah. It's anyone's guess. Hard to say. If I had a crystal old, ball. <laughs> I know if we all had a crystal ball on anything, right? <laughs> and I guess it's hard to say because they're trying to grow Canada's population. I know. So it, it, you know, that's the only difference between us and Japan or some of these other Absolutely. countries is they're trying to grow. So yeah. it, interesting. Once you become a permanent resident, you're yes. okay. You're fine. Yes. And then I'm not sure how, I think that's a few years. I don't know. To I be honest, think so. I, I don't think it's an immediate. No, it's not by instant, any stretch. Yeah. But still, at least that encourages people to become permanent residents, which is their overall goal too, I'm sure. Now, somebody who's not a Canadian citizen or permanent resident can come and buy commercial space, can buy mm -hmm. a business, you know, a shoe store, correct? You know, whether it's the land or it's just the business itself. So they're exempt there. Is that correct? With some caveat that if the land is zoned residential or mixed zoning, if residential, like if it's zoned commercial and residential, you know, like you see this with quite a few towers, right? You'll have a, a retail commercial on the main floor too, and then a residential. Upstairs. Yeah. Um, so if it has, even if there's not a, a dwelling, like a residential dwelling on the property, if it has that zoning designation, then that could be. Okay. So, and this is, you know, I think that leads to a odd conclusion if you're buying a commercial space in a mixed you in a like a multi-zoned yes. area because you're buying a commercial space and that commercial space is all you can do with that particular one is use it as you know retail or for commercial you can't convert it into a residential, residential. but the the door is whether you want to say open or close there but it because it, it includes uh, a property that is zoned a residential, or a residential component, even if there's not a dwelling on right. it. Right. So as long as if the zoning, it goes by the zoning. So if the zoning has a residential component, that's sort of what trumps. Yeah. So, but if you bought a standalone building that was zoned commercial, only commercial, you'd be okay. Yeah. If you buy a, a warehouse out in like an industrial park right. that okay. does some industrial thing in there, that's then that's, you're okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Good to know. That is because I know. actually do think that we had more commercial foreign consumers last year or in previous years than we did on residential. So yeah. mm -hmm. at least that component won't change apart for the mixed use. So, so maybe let's jump into some of the other rules that we've, that we've the got. New changes. New yeah. changes. Yeah. So I think the other one then, um, that's probably kind of the next most complicated, I suppose, would be the cooling off period. It's the rescission period, home buyer rescission yes. period. Yes. Everybody's calling it the cooling off period. So that came into effect January 3rd. So it's in effect now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why didn't they make the dates line up? I'm know. just curious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not in charge. <laughs> so yeah, that came into effect January 3rd, uh, and it is a three-day rescission period for residential property. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't apply to commercials. So if you're right, okay. out there looking at commercial spaces, you're a sophisticated buyer, no, no rescission period. Uh, if you're buying pre-build, you don't get the seven-day Real Estate Development Marketing Act rescission period and the three-day cooling off period. Okay. You only get your seven day and right. then for buying this beautiful property, you would have the, just the standard three day. Yeah. The three day. Yeah. So to back up a little, the reason they've brought that in for those who are watching or listening who aren't familiar with that, I think, you know, this came about on the heels of bidding wars and, and lots of press about people overextending themselves, buying subject free, you know, jumping in in the heat of the moment or, you know, the excitement of the, that competitiveness and then regretting it or, you know, having time to think about it going, holy smokes, what yeah. have I just done? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. So is it necessary in the current market? No, probably not. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but it's in place and it's here to mm -hmm. stay. Right. So when our market changes, um, it, it's going to just affect those purchases that are multiple offer situations likely, or those that go in subject free. Cause yeah. really, if you have your subjects in place, just so everybody sort of understands, if you have your subjects in place for two weeks, it's not really going to apply because your subjects, you have that time to do your due diligence anyway. Correct. Yeah. Because so. you, in that instance, 
you would actually be silly to exercise your rescission period because there's a penalty. Right. Right. So the penalty is 0.25% of your purchase price. Mm -hmm. So if it's a million dollar purchase price, it's a $2,500 uh, penalty. Right? And that goes to the so, sellers, right? Correct. Yeah. So, and that there's kind of no ifs, ands, buts, like it has to be. Paid. Right. Right. Um, so you're best to wait until day four or five. Because then in, you could just say we're not removing subjects. Right. Right. And not so. have to be penalized for it. But if we return to a market, which I don't think is forecast anytime soon, but if we did return to a market where there were multiple offers and, you know, I think it's, they're trying to be fair. I understand the, the background of it because if a seller, you know, can only sell to one person, they have five offers and they go with offer number A mm -hmm. and, and then person number A on day two and a half says, no, I've changed my mind. And they go back to all the other people who have since purchased something else you know, they recoup a little bit. Yeah. At least. Yeah. So it's, and, and yeah, I think the to principle prevent, is good. Yeah. To prevent tire kickers too a bit, right. Yeah, that I you're agree. Not go yeah. and, you just know. make a bunch of offers and really have no plans yeah. to, they're going to be invested yeah. consumers. So, yeah. yeah. So the paperwork has changed, you know, it's, it's addressed in the standard contract to purchase and sale we deal with now where you do talk about the rescission period and what that penalty will be if somebody does decide to, to not proceed with an offer within three days. Yeah. But Otherwise, yep. it's pretty straightforward and it's sort of life as normal. Yeah. Yeah. Conceptually, it's, you know, you've got kind of this three-day parachute clause with a monetary fine associated with it. But but yes, otherwise, you would still draft your contracts with subject to mm -hmm. inspection, financing, mm -hmm. you know, whatever Lawyer is pertinent. Approval. Yeah, whatever is pertinent for, right. for the property, for the purchaser, et cetera. Um, a few things to keep in mind, and you'll have seen this then in the contract. Um, if anybody does exercise that rescission window... It has to be done within three business days. Um, and you have right. to be careful of what a business day is. Right. So it, um, it doesn't include Sundays. It's not statutory holidays. Um, but you have to be careful of days in lieu. So say November 11th, Remembrance Day is on a uh, Sunday. If you have the Monday off, that's not actually like a non-business day. That's just a day in lieu, right? So oh, that's just right. the thing to just be careful of when you have to count days. Fortunately, how the, the contract is drafted or revised, you know, you have to basically for each offer, counter offer, kind mm -hmm. of put in these dates so that it's not a, a guessing game. Right. It's not you're, a surprise it's not, after. Exactly. You're, you're doing that while you're kind of going through the negotiation process, but sure. it's just important to keep that, that in mind and mm -hmm. how to actually count the days. And if, if you're not sure, just ask. Yeah. Um, and then how notice is provided. You have to be careful that... Say right. you don't receive notice within the um, kind of expiration of the rescission period. The notice is kind of deemed, it's when it's sent, not when it's received. So ah. if it's sent by registered mail at the end of a Wednesday and you had until midnight on that Wednesday to kill the deal, and if the seller doesn't get it until the Thursday, it's still been... okay rescinded properly because, because it's, it's when, when it was sent. sent and now something else on that you don't have to send it by registered mail you can, and you can have it that it's your realtor that gets that notice on your behalf is that correct or how does that so the legislation says provided to the seller mm -hmm. so you know this is getting into the laws of agency that you know if it's provided to you is that deemed service and then you have to promptly provide it along to to your client right um but they've got information at the bottom of the, the new standard form contract where you can put in where you're sort of willing to accept your service. To. Right. So it, you're right. It doesn't have to be registered mail. It can be fax. I don't know how to send a fax. <laughs> I don't know I what proficiency I is know. with thinking, people with fax. Fax. <laughs> how? Absolutely. So you can send a fax. <laughs> or you can send an email. But if you send an email, you have to send a red receipt. Right. They don't okay. have to click that, you know, I have whatever, I accept the red receipt or whatever right. you do. I don't think anybody in the history of email has ever clicked, you know, yes, yes I accept yes. the red receipt or whatever, mm -hmm. but you have to send it with that. If you just send an email without the red receipt, it might not you technically haven't served it properly. Uh, and now right. You're, you're okay. Closed. Interesting. Interesting. So, oh, good to know. It so is. That's, yeah. that's the cooling off or rescission period. Yeah. Next we've got, <laughs> 
I know it's crazy when you think of it. You're like, <laughs> it really okay, is. rule this, it's, this, yeah. this, this. But yeah. again, we've come through COVID times where it was it was absolutely a frenzy. I mean, there was mm-hmm. no rhyme or reason. We, we've been doing this for a long, long time. We've you've been doing this a long time. Nobody's yeah. ever seen a market like that. No. Yeah, that and was... I think the government stepped in and just said, "We've got to help some of these people make this easier yeah. and pr- and protect people." Yeah. yeah. So. So it all came at once. So the last one that we have, <laughs> and hopefully this is the last yeah. one we get for this year. We'll see. We'll see. So there's the no flipping rule. Right. Uh, so this is if you sell a home within 365 days of your purchase, it's deemed any profit is deemed to be income, like business right. income, yes. and you're taxed accordingly. So that is the starting point. You can sort of pick a fight with a CRA to push back on this on the basis of, uh, you know, there was a a death in the family, you know, a a marital breakdown, um, you know, relocation for work. There's a few other exemptions. Mm -hmm. But in the first instance, you're guilty and you have to prove yourself innocent to to CRA to not get, get hit with it. And then if you sell at a loss... Too bad, but you don't get to like claim any business loss for future years. And, and okay. the change in that is it used to be that it was deemed capital gains. So capital gains tax, of course, is is much lower typically than somebody's income tax. Capital gains is about 22%. Yeah. It, I know. Generally, people would say half of half. Right. So. But, right. Yeah. Okay. But, but yeah. So, so that's the difference there. So yeah. just really, if you're buying a property, you're going to hold on to it for a year overall, unless there's some situation that happens in circumstance that's out of your control. Yeah. And then that's a, a conversation with your accountant. I don't know if there's some special form or if you just write a letter that, you know, right. say I, you know, bought this property tomorrow and, you know, in six months we open a satellite office in, yeah. I don't know, somewhere else and yes. off I go. And I sell this, then you know right. I don't know if do I just write a letter saying I now live somewhere else for work. So right. I sold. That's you know and the, there's probably a, an owner and an accountant sort of right field to navigate, but it's just a timeline to be aware of. Well, and I Makes think sense. again with what happened during COVID, there were people purchasing a home in April, mm-hmm. selling it in May. Yeah. The profit had gone up a hundred, two hundred thousand. Then whoever bought it in May sold it in October, and it had gone up another. One or two hundred thousand. It's so true. So you're right. Some, you know, people's incomes have 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 been affected tremendously. They're making way more buying, and in many cases, not even doing anything, just holding on, just again through that, and not even holding on for long. So the government, of course, is going to step into that and go, whoa, 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 wait a second. This should be income. This, yeah, we need to be taxing this. Mm-hmm. So now the market's changed. Mm-hmm. The likelihood that somebody's going to buy a property in April and make a hundred and four weeks later. <laughs> That market's gone. <laughs> yeah. And, Long gone. And so likely this isn't really going to affect us that much. Again, yeah. it's, you know, and it's just being aware of holding onto a property for a year. And it goes back to what we always talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, people look and go, well, should I buy right now? The market's down. And we look and go, well, absolutely, you should buy right now. Mm-hmm. The market's down. Like things are on yeah. sale. Just don't plan to be selling it in a month, two months, a year even. Like right. really, you know, you buy and, and hold. And mm-hmm. we're sort of back to that balanced market strategy anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Back to value buying. Yeah. So the other, there is one more. Uh, <laughs> oh, there is one more. Oh, no. Uh, well, this one, it's, it's old. This was from the end of November. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ages. It's ages ago. No wonder we forgot about it. <laughs> um, changes to the Strata, Strata Property Law Act. Um, yeah, To right, now of course. get rid of age restrictions um, and rental restrictions. Now, the age restriction of 55 and up remains in place. Mm-hmm. But if you had a 19 only, 19 only building, anything along those lines... It's gone. That's just gone. Now, could that have been enforced? I mean, for years, mm-hmm. you know, we'd talk about this and, and there were buildings, I mean, over 18, I know we've said to people, legally that can't be enforced. You know, you're not allowed to restrict on age, but I, you know, I know people could make somebody uncomfortable. I don't know that we've ever sold a, mm-hmm. a 19 year old in a, a plus 40 plus. building, but were they able to actually enforce it prior to this rule coming in? Yeah, I don't Fortunately, and do an in-depth strata practice because yeah. there's a lot of moving parts to that one. Um, so I don't, I'm not as current on the strata case law, but my understanding is that yes, you you could you know pick a fight to right. enforce these because you can't discriminate on yes. you know mm-hmm. basically any grounds, but a carve out seems to be a, an age allowance, um, and the 55 plus people seem to be happy to let that one lie. Yes. Um, 
but without actually double checking, I'd be hesitant to confirm yeah. for the Yeah, plus the two, does someone want to move into a building where everybody else in the strata is not going to be happy with them and it creates exactly. havoc and everything else, whereas, you know, going by one in another property where you're not going to have that. So that's probably, that's why we haven't really run across it necessarily. Right. Yeah, but right. exactly. Good but point, the, the big thing is, is now no rental restrictions. So if you've got in a bare land strata where they had rental restrictions, now you can rent that property. I mean, that's, that's opened the door for a lot of consumers that were looking at selling that are now saying, well, wait a second, I don't have to sell. If I'm moving out of here, I can keep this as a rental property. Yeah. So that's opened that for well, lots of people. Well, and it's nice too because speculation tax, you know, which is a mm. relatively new d tax that we had in BC. And if, if, it, you know, if you were in a, a strata property and you go south for the winter, we have lots mm -hmm. of snowbirds who go south, they couldn't rent their property out because they just weren't allowed. But if they aren't spending at least six months here in Kelowna, if they spend six months in Palm Springs and six months less a day in Kelowna, they were, even though they couldn't rent, they would still pay speculation tax. So if it's their, not their principal residence. Right. Yeah. So because they weren't allowed to rent. So I think it, I think that one is, is actually going to, to have an impact and have bearing on our market here. I think so too. Plus yeah. too, it's going to open up the door, you know, for lots of different people as well that can, can utilize that. Absolutely. Just mm -hmm. like you're saying. Yeah. You can still have your short-term use restrictions. So this is your yes. Airbnb and, and that sort of a thing. But uh, long-term rentals are, are fair game. Mm -hmm. And then, but what you want to be careful of on the purchaser side is when you're reviewing these bylaws, there might still be bylaws that say, you know, it's a 45 plus building and yes. only three rentals at a time or whatever it says. So when you're reading those bylaws, those are deemed as of the kind of end of November, they just don't apply anymore. Right. But what you want to be careful of, and this is more of kind of the strata governance side, if there's just one sentence that says, you know, age restriction 45, next sentence, new provision is no rentals, fine. But if it's all jumbled together in some long wordy paragraph, mm. can it be pulled apart what's enforceable and not enforceable, or is the entire provision struck and then you know, any other kind of restrictions that might be contained in that, ah, that, that section. Whole paragraph mm. could get deleted. So that's where, again, yeah, this is you. more for the management of the strata that do they need to revisit their bylaws? They just need to right. look and, you know, is there kind of any entanglement that should be cleaned up to avoid confusion? Yeah. Or if it's fairly clear that, you know, section 1A says, you know, it's a 45 plus building, that's just gone. gone. Right. You yeah, cross it off. Skip along. To well, and again, and you know, reading. it's probably the theme of our conversation today. But it, it's seek independent legal advice. You know, mm -hmm. make sure and you know do. I'm sure we could hire you to to read 400 pages of strata docs. Might not want to. Like, there's a great mm -hmm. company, um, Condo Clear, in town. Yes, that that you can hire a company to to give you a Coles Notes version of all the yeah. all the strata mm -hmm. rules and regulations. But it's, I mean, it's a, it's. Shocking. It's mind blowing how many buyers purchasing in a condo building and haven't read those rules and, and the bylaws and the bylaws. No. The and it, this is the fascinating thing, too, because when we have commented, it's you know, we'll say that okay, we've read this section, but like you, if you're going to buy and live here, yeah. you need to know what this yes. says, you need to yes. understand this. Are you comfortable with this? Do you take any issue with any of this? So that's mm -hmm. you know, you, you can lead a horse to water, but it, it it's yeah. so true, you yeah. know, it, it's very much in a purchaser owner's best interest to know what the bylaws say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, it's true. It's, we had someone reach out to us, uh, uh, and actually a condo organization or association, and they reached out and said, okay, we've got, we're the management, we're taking on this condo, we own this. Now the owners all are coming to us. It's a 40 plus age restriction right now, and they're going to vote to have it moved up to a 55 plus restriction. Mm. You know, Interesting. And, and I didn't know that. So I wonder if we'll see a bit more of that coming down. And, you know, our advice is, well, you do limit the buyer pool. So as soon as you change it now to 55 plus, you're limiting your buyer pool drastically. And who is your buyer? You know, are they 55 plus or are they not? And that's something to sort of look at. If they're majority in the 40s, well, then you don't want to, you yeah. know, you don't want to have and, that. And nowadays with, you know, with lots of properties for sale and, and not as many buyers, you want to keep the door open as wide as you can. You want to attract as many buyers as you can. So yeah, yeah. it's an interesting point. I, I hadn't thought of that. Of Which, buildings. But then when you have people voting, right, you have people who are thinking, okay, I'm going to sell in the next five years. So here's my interest versus people who yes. say I bought a year ago and I want to live here for another 15 years. So, yes. uh, you know, trying to align those interests. And that's yeah, a be critique interesting. of this act that, government has never moved so quickly that it was, right. you know, yes. introduced and implemented 
in a heartbeat instantaneously yeah and there's been no time for any sort of consideration of okay you know there hasn't been like a six like this will come into effect in whatever spring 2023 yeah, like we've got time hasn't... to plan and it was just like boom it's in yeah. okay mm. you know yeah so it's move left... along and deal with it <laughs> yeah so it, yeah. it's you Let know to, to this kind of strata corporation's yeah. point like it's you know it's, it's left a lot of organizations scrambling yes as yeah to what, what do we do what, and what's our path forward and you know what do kind of the majority of our owners want right mm-hmm. Ah, oh, so interesting. It's interesting because it led me down to do some research as to what's the average age in Kelowna. And this is a little bit off topic, but it led me to go and look and go, okay, well, do you want to be 55? Like who at the end of the day is really your buyer and what's your buyer pool looking like? And right now in the marketplace, there are quite a few 55 plus buyers. You know, that's mm-hmm. when you look at our age demographic in Kelowna and that sort of thing, it's pretty good. Then if you analyze and look at what the market or what they predict the age is going to be and where our highest volume of age is going to be, by 2040, I think is what I went to, um, EDC Invest Kelowna has a great app on their website where you can actually slide the scale and it shows you um, in a picture of where our age is going to be. And it's 35 to 39 yes. is going to be the highest. So that's not that long away. Nope. You know, 18 years from now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, do you really want to put those restrictions in place when you're yeah. really going to be limiting that buyer pool down the road? But Anyway, interesting, mm. sort of off topic. But. No, it's not off topic at all. It's great. Yeah. Well, it really like a interesting. interesting website. I'll have to. It's, oh, it, it's yeah. fascinating. It's fascinating. I get Give stuck on there. Give time. It's so, it's, it's, it's really, really fascinating. Yeah. Anybody thinking of moving to Kelowna, anyone mm-hmm. here already? And, and it, people who are, are curious and want, you know, want answers and want details, it's fascinating. Yeah, it really is. Say it again, Sean. Mm-hmm. Investkelowna.ca. So that's the Economic Development Commissioner's website. So, yeah. So maybe we can jump through. We've got all the rules, right? Are we, phew, are we done? Got all the changes. Changes. Yeah, not rules, Four I guess. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more or talk into some of the things that you see on titles. Is there things that people should be watching or maybe your kind of best tips when you're purchasing? What are the things you should look for? Yeah. So if you're buying bare land and you're going to build, we want to look at everything on title. Because, Absolutely. you know, your building permits have to be in accordance with whatever statutory right away and, you know, BC Hydro or Ford's power box or this or that. But it's important to kind of know, you know, mm-hmm. how much space do you have to build? What can you do? Can you put a pool there? Is there a septic tank there? Mm-hmm. You know, all, all of that. So if you're buying land and you want to build, you want to look at everything. Okay. If you're buying existing that hasn't had any kind of significant renovations, um, then you don't need to look at all the statutory right of ways. Then we just typically look for easements, covenants, and uh, building schemes. So there's oh. an interesting one. Sorry, you just got me <laughs> thinking about it. Um, a, a new uh, housing subdivision in Kelowna, existing homes, but they've got a um, a fence going through, you know, the backyard. Yes. And everybody said, okay, well, you know, once that's mine, once I own it, then I'll take that fence down because my property line actually goes far beyond that. Mm -hmm. Well, the fence is sort of indicating where there's a riparian zone, old Uh, marshland, mm -hmm. wetland, and you actually can't take the fence down. You can't do anything. And it really is impacting these properties. And and the majority of people that we're hearing of didn't know about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that will be covenants. Um, So a covenant, it can be all kinds of things. There's wildfire covenants in Kelowna because we keep pushing further and further into the trees. Right. Um, so we'll say, you know, you have to kind of, you know, prune your pine trees and rake up pine needles. Um, but then to your point, there's covenants where if you're on a slope near water, anything like that, you might have uh, a fairly large property, but the area that you can actually use might be mm-hmm. quite small because it might be a no disturb zone. It might be a no build zone. It, right. You know, or it might be a you can't build here unless a geotechnical engineer gives you the green light or, you know, it right. depends so what look, it says. <laughs> look closely at that and, and get legal advice on, on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. No, it yeah. makes sense. So, so that's covenants because they covenants. can right. kind of carry all manner of, of sin under the heading of covenant. Okay. And right. They're, they're, and it's easy to know. skim over. You know, again, I think it's something that, you know, people will ask us as the realtors and say, okay, well, what do these all mean? And we say, you know, we can't give you legal advice. We've here, here is what they say. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. you know, have a careful look through this, but really get somebody, you know, who's able to give you proper advice because it could, it could really, really impact the property and the, your use and enjoyment of that property for sure. Exactly. And, you know, for the prices people are spending on property and that, you know, this is going to be your home and if it's your dream to you know, I don't know, build a large workshop or something like that. And then you find yeah. out you can't. That changes mm-hmm. it. So for sure. covenants are very important. Easements are very important. So those allow um, 
another owner access over part of your property. Right. Um, you know, their old ones that we see are for like old waterways and, right. and stuff like that. It's, but what you might see now is if a property was subdivided, you've got kind of an existing house in the front, a driveway beside it, and right. then an older house in the back. So depending on how the subdivision kind of took place, um, whether or not that driveway allowing access to the back, is that an easement over the first right. property so front property mm -hmm. uh parcel or is that like a you, you know we'd have to kind of look at plans and figure that out but if there's an easement that encumbers your property yes you own that land but you can't do anything you to, can't do anything right, with it that, that would you know kind of affect the other person's use of that easement so often for access and right. something we see a lot of is inter alia yeah. so we'll see an easement and then it says inter alia or you, you know you see these things and what does that mean? I mean, I think I know what I know what I tell people <laughs> while we're here getting legal advice. <laughs> so it's registered over multiple properties. Okay. So right. it covers the area. Sort mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you look at title, there's your notations and then there's your charges. So if I own lot A and you own lot B and I have an easement over your property, I'm going to have a notation with my easement and you're going to have a charge with that easement. Right. So they're going to okay. kind of they're refer. kind of combined together. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So so you can Helpful. kind of That's good to yeah, know. Yeah, it is good to know. Yeah. So you're saying the right thing. It should be. <laughs> yeah. Thank you goodness know, after how many years in real estate? Yeah, yeah, 28. <laughs> um. You know, sometimes there's old old titles and old old yes. charges from way way back yeah. and you know And they're still there and you just have to so. Yeah, or you know it might be registered as a charge or not a notation, but you know if it's still registered as burdening the property then And you can, I know we're we're winding up our time here, but you can an old easement or something that's not applicable anymore, you can get those removed. There's a cost associated with it, right? It's it's onerous. If everybody or is it impossible? If everybody is in agreement. In agreement. So if that easement is still being used, then unless I can find another mm -hmm. source of access for you, then, or unless you agree, right. then, 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 then no, but easements otherwise. are bears. Okay. Okay. Good so. to know. So I think the overall messaging would be when you get your title, get legal advice, looking at all of those things and making sure that you're buying and being able to use it the way that you're hoping to use it. And I think that's really important, um, which is also nice going back to the way our market is now. We're now buyers and consumers have time yes. to do their due diligence. They're having time now to go and get an opinion from a lawyer and, and, you know, get it's, that advice. It's a great point. You know, so. you don't have five minutes to quickly glance at a title because the market was there. People yeah. were, were waving titles and, and not, not really paying attention. And mm -hmm. as you said, I mean, it's average house price is almost a million dollars here. It's a huge investment. You, yeah. you do want a little time to make sure yeah. you're well informed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was amazing. So thank you so much. Yeah, How can people welcome. find you? Uh, .com is, is probably the best way. Or if you just Google Alice McLeod lawyer, I'll pop up. You'll pop up. <laughs> so that was amazing. We so appreciate your insight. So yeah, thank you very much. Here, so thank yeah. you for inviting me. Yeah, of you course. Bet. Thank right. you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Estate for Real People. If you want to reach out to the Stone Sisters, visit www.stonesisters.com. This podcast was produced by Podigy Podcasts. See you next time.